your hands and shout for joy, for the Lord God is almighty and awesome. Good morning, church. How wonderful that we have folks here present to clap your hands. We give welcome to all of you present and to all of you who are able to join us via uh, Facebook Live this morning. We pray God's blessing on us, for we've gathered in the spaces where we are to worship our Lord and Savior. Not only do we celebrate being together, but I wanted to take a moment to thank all of our faith community who participated in the food drive for our community food pantry yesterday. It was almost 900 pounds of food was collected for our community food drive. That's a great celebration. Um, and that food is on the shelf and will be given out tomorrow as the pantry opens. For those of you at home that are not near uh, or were not able to participate in this, we invite you to, to locate a community food pantry where you might share some of your things, your gifts with others who are in need. We are all blessed to be able to do that in the name of God the Father. And now we continue in worship. Amen. Thank you. We continue in worship with the scripture reading this morning. It comes from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Hear now the word of the Lord. <clears throat> 
For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but there, where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that did not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would come and he would become the father of many nations according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's truth telling time. How many of you, well, you, you don't have to answer. You can do it in your mind because the people at home are not letting us know. How many of you, as I was reading, and when I finished, would feel like saying, what? What? You scratch in your head like, what? Well, believe me, when God was giving me this text to preach on, I'm going, you want me to preach on that? What? It's a little bit uh, dense, isn't it? It's like, what in the world is going on? Let's, let's take a look together at this to see what God has in store for us. Because I would have much rather turned over a few more pages like, ah, let's find Paul's writing, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is... That would be good, right? I get that. But God gave us Romans 4 today. So what is it about? First of all, I think we need... If we look at the book of Romans, period, we understand that the Apostle Paul was writing to the Christians at Rome. And remember... He did not yet know them. Unlike other places where he had been proclaiming the gospel and he had friends and he always greeted people there, his hope and desire was to go to Rome where there were believers in God. But he had not been. So he's writing a very concise, a very dense and well-crafted expose, if you will, or argument, if you will, on his faith in Jesus Christ. The book of Romans was to serve as an introduction to the people, the Christians in Rome, about who Paul is and how and what he believed in Jesus Christ. And many scholars even say that in Romans, the apostle Paul is rethinking his idea for Paul was a Jew very schooled in all of the Old Testament and, and that he was rethinking his faith 
in light of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which many of the people in that day were doing anyway. So we know that it's a well-crafted, a very densely packed. He's using all his best words, right? His expensive, his 50 cent words in this text. The first thing that we, that might enable us to, to move beyond the what is to know that what transpires before today's reading is an understanding Paul has, and in, indeed those folks who are reading this text, that all people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That the way God created humanity in the beginning, that relationship we were to have with God at creation, that has been disrupted by sin. And from the very moment that sin entered the picture into the lives of humanity, disrupting that relationship with God, God began to work to change that, to bring humanity back. God had a plan, has a plan. And Paul begins to show us pieces of that plan in his writings. And he begins by talking about Abraham. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, Abraham in, encounters God yet again, and God makes a covenant with Abraham and tells him that he would be the father of many nations. That in this covenant, you will, you will have all peoples. You will be the father of so many people. And Paul begins to let us know that this covenant extended not only to the Jewish people, but to all humanity. This was a universal availability because the way Abraham entered the covenant with God to have his relationship with God restored was to believe, to believe in God. And that that belief, that faith, that faith that Abraham had with God would be what justified him, set him on the right track, restored, renewed the relationship. So Paul is telling us of what that relationship looks like, of what Abraham's faith looks like. But in so doing, we're finding an awful lot about God. Because I'm sure you heard the word grace mentioned in this, that Abraham's relationship with God that was restored, that came through him believing in God, believing in the power and the glory and the might and believing in God's promises. That relationship was given to, Ab to Abraham. He didn't earn it. It wasn't that he, he did this, gave to the food pantry, helped other people, all these things. And check, check, check. Ah, now relationship restored. That's a works righteousness where we feel like we have to earn it. Abraham's relationship with God began moving toward restoration simply because he believed. He had faith in God and in what God could do and that God's promises were true. And now we can look at what that faith looked like because for me, as I began to unpack and pray through this text, I began to see Abraham as a model for how you and I can live more fully into that restored relationship. One of the parts I like the most, and you may remember it from our reading here, is when uh, you begin with verse 18. And it's, here's some of this again. I'm going to read 18, 19, uh, at least again. It's speaking about Abraham. Hoping against hope, he, Abraham, 
believed that he would become the father of many nations. He would become that father of many nations according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. That's what God told him. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old. Do any of you ever wake up in the morning and feel like your body is about as good as dead? I don't use those languages, but sometimes I wake up and wonder how I could feel so much more tired than when I went to bed in the evening. Maybe that's a sign of age. But you see, God called Abraham, called him when he was an old man. And it goes on to talk about Sarah's womb. He tells them that they're going to have a child when to begin that fathering of the nations, have children, so many children. It'll be more than the sands on the sea, more than the stars in the sky. And they are well beyond childbearing years. Abraham believed. He believed because of who was saying this to him, who was making the covenant. Now, sometimes when we think about that belief, we may think that Abraham's faith, his belief was, well, it was perfect. Far better, far more than anything, I believe. But if we look closely at Abraham's story, we see that there are, well, Abraham was a whole lot like you and I. Just this morning, I was talking with someone <clears throat> uh, here for worship on things that I still keep working on with my relationship with God. And one of those would be to Give over to God those things that I cannot take care of, that I cannot fix. Are, are any of you fixers? Are you the ones that want to fix things? And have we not in almost a year now been living in a time where we can't fix it? Many have decided that, as I have, that the way to help in this situation is to get the vaccine. But I can't fix it. I thought we'd be back in, in worship, in the worship space, everyone all together. And I sure didn't think we'd still be wearing these and we're not done yet. But there's so much that I can't fix. And so in my prayers, I pray. I, I ask God, to, you take it, you, you fix it, I can't. And I know that God takes it, but here's what happens next. After I've given it up, totally believing, totally knowing that God, the creator of the universe, the one who loves us more than we could ever imagine, I begin to take pieces of it back. I'll come up with my own plan about how to solve things. Or if there are people that I, I care about that are going through difficulties, whether it be of body, mind, spirit difficulties, whether it is those dealing with the pain of grief, and I can't help them, and I give it to God, asking God to take it and show me what I need to do for it, I will make up my own plan begin to, and the timetable. Abraham went through part of that as well. If you read his story, you see he believed, but he also knew that the humanness in him, that justification, that relationship with God was something that was being ongoing and transformed in an ongoing way. And so he couldn't always follow with perfect belief. The time, timing was not always right. Here, at one point, Abraham said, now, Lord, how is this child going to happen? 
And like in Romans, Paul wrote, his body was as good as dead. So was Sarah. Do you remember, if you know the story, when God told Sarah that she was to have a baby, she laughed at 80 years old. I'm not sure I'd laugh. I'd have to sit down real quick, I think. But you, you see what I'm saying? The, the belief, the ancestor of all of God's people, the one who shows us what it means to live in relationship with God, his faith, his belief was not perfect. It was not out of our reach. It was very much like we are believing and yet needing more of God's love and grace to continue to transform and develop and enrich that belief. I couldn't help but think of the story that Jesus, <clears throat> well, he is a part of, is found in the ninth chapter of Mark's gospel, is also found in Luke and, and Matthew, told just a little differently, but the same story where a man comes and brings his son to Jesus for healing, and his son has, in, in theological language of the Bible, an unclean spirit. And he asked, first of all, seeing the disciples, he asked them to heal him, and they couldn't. And Jesus comes and says, you must have faith. You must believe that he can be healed. And the man of the boy calls out and says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when I remembered that story, it helped me understand that, yes, I believe in the power and the glory and the grace of God, but I still have unbelief. I'm surprised always at how God works things out. Not that I don't think God can do it. But our relationship, my relationship, yours with God, is continuing to be justified, to be brought to where it needs to be, for we are being transformed. So when we doubt, we are not casting belief in God out the window, but perhaps our prayer should be, help my unbelief. I love that the man said that, he offered that, help me. And for some of us, that is hard to say, isn't it? I know I've had some surgeries in my lifetime, which I am grateful to have, made me much better and more mobile. But there were particular moments in the getting over that surgery where I was more helpless than I've ever been in my whole life. And I hated every second of that. And yet, if I were to go and help someone else, that would be fine. Are you like that? We're not looking for help for us, but oh, let me help you or you or anyone else. Help my unbelief, O oh Lord. For you see, Abraham knew in his believing, in his trusting, and even in those moments of unbelief where he came up with his own plan, he knew that the God he believed in was a God who could speak and creation happened. A God who could bring forth light out of darkness. A God who could bring forth life out of death. That is our God, friends. The God in whom we believe my prayer for you, for me, is that we ask God to help our unbelief and we continue to grow in the grace and faith of the God who makes life from death. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.
deserves an amen, doesn't it? Thank you. Thank you. I invite us now, friends, into a time of prayer, and I will begin the prayer with verses from Psalm 90. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Oh God, for these words of scripture, we give you thanks. For you indeed are our God and you have always been. We praise you, oh God, we worship you, we cherish who you are. And we are so thankful for the way you continue to work in our lives gracing us with faith, gracing us with love, transforming us into your most precious Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh God, for the blessings of this life, for all the ways that you are involved in our lives, blessing us with family and friends, with opportunity to share all that we have with others, with ways to make a difference for good, loving us just as we are. Thank you, O oh God, for the blessings of life. We come to you this morning with grateful hearts that we are able to gather in many different ways, yet gather together as your people in worship and praise. O oh Lord, we lift before you all of those we know and love and ask that you would tailor your blessings for their necessities. That you would indeed begin to bring peace and comfort and wholeness to those who struggle and suffer with body, mind, or spirit. We pray for comfort for all who mourn. We pray, O oh God, that you will continue to lead us in paths of righteousness. So as we are in your created world, we may love you more and so love others and all creation so that we participate with you in the transformation. 
As many students will be beginning school in person again and teachers as well, we ask for your protection, for your grace in learning, for encouragement for teachers and all workers in schools, for your rest and protection for those in the healthcare industry, oh Lord, in so many areas. We thank you for all the people that make our lives better. May we continue to be thankful people, gracious God. And we ask now that you would hear us as your people. And as we pray together, the prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. And now friends, I invite you to stand as you are and those of you at home to extend the sign of blessing and let us just share that sign of blessing to one another. And we extend to all of you at home, may God bless you this day. Let us share the word of, a safe way of blessing one another. And now, friends, I invite you to receive this blessing as you move forward into this day. May God, the Father, the Creator, who loves us with a love whose, whose love knows no depth. Jesus Christ, whose peace and grace is a part of our lives always. And the Holy Spirit, who gives us power to live and love. May they be with you, guiding and keeping and protecting you always. Go forth with the joy of the Lord. Amen and amen.